Now it came about in the eleventh year, on the first of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said concerning Jerusalem, Aha, the gateway of the people is broken. It has been opened unto me. I shall be filled now. Um, well, I lost my place. I shall be filled now that she is laid to waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am also against you, O Tyre, and I will bring up the many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves, and they will destroy the walls of Tyre and break, uh, break down her towers and scrape her debris from her and make her as a bare rock. And she will be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And she will become a great spoil for all the nations. And her daughters who are on the mainland will be slain by the sword. For they will know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, the king of kings with horses and chariots, cavalry and a great army of men. And he will say to your daughters on the mainland with the so he will slay your daughters on the mainland with the sword, and he will make siege walls against you, and cast up a mound against you, and raise up a large shield against you. And the blow of his battering rams he will direct against all your walls with his axes he will break down your towers. <clears throat> because of the multitude of his horses, the dust raised by them will cover you, and your walls will shake at the noise of the cavalry and the wagons and the chariots. When he enters your gates as men enter the city that has been breached. With the hooves of his horses he will trample all your streets. He will slay your people with the sword. And your... This is fun, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I'm going to preach from this today. <clears throat> and your strong pillars will come down to the ground. And they will make spoil of all your riches and prey of all your merchandise. Break down your walls, destroy your pleasant homes, and throw your stones and your timbers uh, and your debris into the sea. And I will silence the sound of your songs, and the sound of your harps will be heard no longer. And I will make you as a bare rock. You will be a place for the spreading of nets, and you, shall built no, you will be built no longer. For I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the Lord of hosts. Thus say to the Lord God, to Tyre, shall not the, whole, shall not the coastland shake at the sound of your fall, and the, uh, when the wonderful groan and the slaughter occurs in your midst? Then all the princes of the sea will go down from their thrones and remove their robes and strip off their embroidered garments. And they will clothe themselves with trembling and they shall sit upon the ground and tremble at every moment and be appalled at your sight. <clears throat> and they shall take up a lamentation over you and they shall say, How you have perished, O inhabited one. From the seas, O renowned city, which was mighty upon the water, she and her inhabitants who imposed their great terror on all their inhabitants. Now the coastlands will tremble on the day of your fall. Yes, the coastlands which are by the sea will be terrified at your passing. For thus says the Lord God, when I shall make you a desolate city, like the cities which are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep over you, as the great waters will cover you, and I shall bring you down with those who go down to the pit, to the people of old, and I shall make you dwell in the lower parts of the earth, like the ancient waste places, with those who go down into the pit, so that you will, be, uh, you will not be inhabited, but I shall set glory in the land of the living. I shall bring ter great terror upon you, and you will be no more. Though you will be sought, you will never be found again. Thus declares the Lord of hosts. Well, God's having a bad day. What do you think about that? The land of Tyre. Where is the land of Tyre? Well, let me do my Insto map of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. You all recognize this. This is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. Pretty easy to do that. Uh, Jerusalem's like right there somewhere, or close thereabouts. And way over yonder, about 43 miles away, a little thing I like to call the Mediterranean Sea. 
This is the ocean over here. The typography is such that this is what they call the Jezreel Valley and it comes all the way out. Actually, this part of the coastline has a little jut out like that. Um, and it comes down like this and this is where the this is the only flat space in the Holy Land in Israel. Everything else south and north are mountains uh, until they get down to the sea. Of course then it slopes and it gets a little flatter over by the sea. But most of Israel is mountains. This is the only spot that is not. Uh, it's about 25 miles, 27 miles uh, wide and maybe eight or, or long and about eight miles uh, wide. It's the only flat space. You come down out of the mountains and you got this, what they call the Jezreel Valley and then you go back up in the mountains. And is it Armageddon in there? Yeah, Armageddon's over here. Or Megiddo. Megiddo. Is over here. Uh, anyway, the thing is that 90% or more of all the battles in the Bible are fought in this valley. So when you hear of David coming against these guys or these guys coming to the four kings fighting the five kings and the three kings fighting the two kings and this guy in Havanah coming against everybody, it's usually fight, they're, they're fighting out here. And the reason was because it's the only decent place you could fight. You know, when you're up in a mouse, that's too hard to get horses and chariots and, and stuff like that up in a mountain. So they'd say, all right, you come bring your boys over here, you bring your boys over here, and we'll battle it out and may the best man win. So it's a very active valley. This is known also, it is referred to in the Bible, as the Valley of Blood, if you ever hear uh, or read the mention of, and he was slain, like Sesterces was slain in the Valley of Blood. Well, where that's up here. So that's what it all means. Uh, right here is Capernaum. This is where Jesus did the great Sermon on the Mount, next to the sea, and the people were all sitting there, and he started off, you know, blessed are the cheesemakers, and blessed are the, all these other guys that do whatever. Uh, right here, in smack in the middle of the valley, is mountain of Babel or the mountain of transfiguration. It's a cone shaped thing and nobody's really sure why it's even there but it's quite high. It's about 1500 feet high and it just sticks up out of the ground like somebody put it there and it shouldn't be there. This of course is where Jesus went up and was transfigured and Elijah showed up and Moses showed up and God was blasting them and the whole thing. Remember that in the Gospels? Peter, James, and John he took those three up there. And of course Peter says, oh, there's Moses. He's the king. He's just started all this stuff. God's word. And here's Elijah. Elijah, J-A-H, he was the enforcer of God's word. So you got the creator, bringer of God's word and the enforcer of God's word. And then you got Jesus in the middle. And Peter makes a stupid statement by saying, should we build three tabernacles here? The tabernacle, of course, was the innermost part of the Holy of Holies where God lives in the temple, back in the temple. Uh, the inner part of the temple had two chambers, the chamber of the priests and then the Holy of Holies here. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept and only the high priest could go in there once a year on Yom Kippur to offer sacrifice for their sins. That was the tabernacle. So basically, when Peter asks that, he's saying, should we build three tabernacles here? He's equating all three of these with God. Should we do that? And then, of course, the voice from heaven says, what are you, an idiot? <laughs> a, a cloud overshadows him. These two kind of fade. And the voice says, this is my beloved son, Listen to him alone. He's the one you want to focus on, not these monkeys. All right? And that was that. And the transfiguration. And then Jesus came down with the boys and they cast the demons out of the guy down here going crazy and beating everybody up. 
uh, and they were all amazed and then they were scared after that they were scared to ask Jesus any more questions you know having seen all that they went ooh I'm not asking him you ask him <laughs> so it was kind of interesting but that's what happened and it happened on this mountain which is just you know when we when you hear preachers preach on it you really don't understand the typography unless you go there and see this thing sticking up out of the like somebody dropped it there it doesn't belong there not volcanic it's not anything they don't know why it's like that well he may be dead but there it is and nevertheless there's another one of those down here on the sea but it was man-made and by Herod and we call that Mutsara or Masada but this one is natural I didn't make that it was just there and Jesus took advantage of it said boys come on up here we're going to check this out and uh, so it's kind of a sacred revered point and even the Arabs and the enemies don't want to mess with it because they think God put it there and if you bust up God's stuff kind of like God parked his car there mm -hmm. and if you go wreck his car he's going to be real mad at you they don't like the fact that it's in Israel on the Jews property but they, they're not going to mess with it either alright this is the setting Tyre is a city over here this chapter is about Tyre. Sidon was down here. Sidon and Tyre. These were two very important cities because they were seacoast cities. They had ports, they had protection for ships. And of course the ships from Greece and the ships from Malta and the ships from Rome and the ships from Egypt and all these, this was trade. So the cities, as you might know, probably filled with some more of the unhealthier people. Uh, not unhealthy, but lacking, as, as the southerner would say, moral fiber. You lack moral fiber. They were sailors. And of course, there's a lot of women there that are attracted to sailors, and you had that whole thing going on. They were not Jews. The Jews would not sit fit would not set foot in any of these cities. Although Jesus did, he came over to Tyre when he healed the Syrophoenician woman. Who was she? Well, Syria is here. What it was Phoenicia was here. So somehow the Syrian woman made her way over here and or, or a Syrian woman made her way over here, married a Phoenician, and had a daughter who got into trouble, and Jesus had to bail her out. So in the gospel, when it says Jesus spoke to the Syro-Phoenician woman, that's kind of what's happened. She was probably the original mom, was probably attracted to this town to earn a living, the only way a lot of women knew how in those day, day and age. And then there was a child begat, and that child was in trouble when she met Jesus. And of course, Jesus healed, helped heal her daughter. And her daughter was probably born the same way she was. And it's a mess. And you don't hear that coming out of the pulpit because, you know, it's kind of tough to preach on that stuff. But that's what's going on in this day and age. So when the Babylon, or when the Assyrians swept around from way over there at the Persian Gulf and started to destroy everything, these guys thought, hey, Israel's God is not protecting them, so Israel's God must be a bunch of bunk. So, because they were having such success destroying all the Jews, these guys joined the Assyrians. As would, when it came down here to start working on the southern kingdom and Jerusalem, these guys over here did the same thing. They said, well, the Assyrians are really kicking the Jews out of, they're blasting them, and they're, of course, you don't just kill them, you take their cities, you take all their stuff. So there's plenty of good money to be made. And so these guys joined in on them, and of course, eventually, both kingdoms fell. Both kingdoms were laid to waste, and all these people were feeling mighty proud of themselves because they had joined the right team. Oh, be careful about the choices we make. The right team. Little did they understand that God allowed this.
because his people, his children, had become wicked and turned away from him. And yeah, he held them accountable. But even less did they realize, as we talked about, or at least we mentioned last week, God is quite plain about one thing. The earth and everything in it is mine. And whether you acknowledge me or not, whether you believe in me or not, makes no difference. You will answer to me. N-W-S-E-R. You will answer to me. Sooner or later. And God says, every soul shall stand before the judgment seat. Dum, dum, dum. On that great and terrible day. This is God up here. Lightning. Audio-visual really helps, doesn't it? And every soul, that's us, will stand before it. The sea will give up its dead, the land will give up its dead, the earth will give up its dead, Hades will give up its dead, everybody's coming to the party, and one by one they will stand before the Lord, as the scriptures say in Revelation, naked. Not that you won't be wearing clothes, but you will be fully known by the Lord. Everything you've ever thought, said, done, or even thought about saying and doing, you will know it on that day. That's why they call it the great if you're a God believer, or the terrible day if you're not a God believer. But make no know, know this, says the Lord. Everybody will be there. The enemies, as well as the allies, as well as my own children, will all be there. And there will be two items brought out. First will be the book of life. It shall be put upon a stand, says the Lord. And then the books of the deeds. These are all the stuff you guys did or didn't do. They shall be brought forth and put upon a stand. First, your name will be searched over here. And if your name is found in the book of life, then you will enter into the rest of your father. If your name is not found in the book of life, oh, I love colored markers. If your name is not found in the book of life, then you shall be judged according to the books of the deeds, and you will enter into the lake of fire, which is the second death that burns forever. These are not my words. This is not denominational words. This is God's promise. It's not a threat. It's a promise. So, what is the implication of this? It might behoove me to get to know this God while I'm still here. Even though the armies are surrounding me and getting ready to destroy me, like Habakkuk says, let me know my Lord. If you ever read the book of Habakkuk, read the last chapter. It's incredible. Habakkuk yells at God and says, how come you're letting all this wickedness happen in Jerusalem? And God says, oh, I'm not. He says, well, do something about it. And he goes, oh, I am. And he says, what are you doing? He goes, look over the wall, tell me what you see. Well, there's 187,000 soldiers there with sharp, pointy things. And Habakkuk says, this is not what I want. Well, it's, unfortunately, Habakkuk, you're not in charge. You're allowed, but you're not in charge. And he says, well, if they break into the city, they're going to kill everybody. And everybody includes who? Me. Me. He says, this is the dumbest idea you ever had. Basically, God says, well, what are you going to do about it? How do I know? I'm not God. He says, how am I going to live? And the Lord says, what? My righteous shall live by faith. This is the first introduction of this concept of faith. 
Faith is explained by God, both Jesus in action and Paul later in thought, is a two-step process. First is knowledge, and second is living in that knowledge. Well, first is the knowledge. What am I gaining knowledge about? Primarily God. And self, me. He is the great I am. You are the great I ain't. So it might behoove you, if this is true about every soul standing before the Lord, it might behoove you to spend a little time getting to know God. Why? Well, because he made this promise, you see, and by his own words he says, I, the Lord, do not change. I can't change. If I changed one iota, then you could be, you could be assured of nothing. But because I am the same yesterday, back when the earth was created, today and forever to the end of time, you can be assured. Assured of what? Well, you learn about me, you learn about you, and you see, you come to the common sense. This is what we mean when we say you're God-given common sense. You come to the common sense that it would behoove you to join him rather than to rely on the world. At that point, then, you have a decision to make, don't you? And that decision is based, hopefully, on the knowledge that you've gained. It would probably would be a good idea if I lived my life in accordance with what, God, what pleases God. It would probably be a good idea if I stayed away from the things that aggravate God. So you decide yes, the plus sign, I'm going to do this, or you say no, who needs him? You have that choice. He's a great, powerful, mighty God, but he's not going to force it on you. You have that choice to either accept him or walk away. But remember, you are going to meet him whether you like it or not. Whether you acknowledge him or not. Whether you believe in him or not. It doesn't matter. According to his word, if this word is true, well, you've got to deal with that too. That's part of the knowledge thing. If you believe this word, you're going to stand there and he's going to be sitting on his throne and you're going to be right between these two items brought out and all of heaven and the angels will be watching. The heavens and the earth will testify against you. How many times you see that in scripture? 27 times. I didn't know you knew that, Kathy. 27 times. The phrase is used, the heavens and even the earth itself will testify against you. It'll be like Adam Schiff. <laughs> You'll be sitting here going, no, I didn't know that. No, I didn't. <laughs> and the Lord said, oh, but you did know that. You simply chose not to do it. And some people go around thinking that they're good deeds are going to get there. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Even if my name is found in that book, which I'm hoping it is, I know it is because I believe in Jesus, I'm still going to pee myself. <laughs> Sitting in that right there in front of that with everything watching. Even though it's good news, I don't know how you could just hold back anything. You just... This is what happened to Habakkuk on the tower when he suddenly realized and came into the presence of God. He dropped into what we, or what they call a shigoinath. A shigoinath is a Hebraic term which means total breakdown. Mental, emotional, physical, conscionable, everything just oh. It's like the snowman that melts and just walks with little goofy eyes looking up. That is Shagoyna. That's what happened to Habakkuk when he finally realized who he was yelling at. And God showed up and said, Let's talk. Oh no, what did I do? Dun dun dun. Yeah, mighty man, huh? Remember, this is not a threat. God said it from the very beginning. It's a promise. When he said to Abraham, you sure you want to do this? I'm going to make an everlasting covenant with you, your children, every child that ever is will be created. 
every generation to the end of time. These are the rules we're going to play by. You stay in them, you do fine. You step out of them, it's not going to go so well. I don't care whether you're my children, chosen ones or not. Everybody. And the reason is because the earth, I made the earth. Who do you think did? Nobody. Me. And the people in the earth, I made them too. The good guys and the bad guys, the cowboys and the Indians. The Steelers and the Dolphins. I hated that game. The fact is, everything, everyone is mine. Belongs to me. As for the earth, it was as for you. Oh, it was the sea will give up its dead, and the land will give up its dead, and Hades will give up its dead. They will all congregate and come before me one by one, upon which a decision shall be rendered. Paul says it best in Hebrews, it is given to every man, it is given to every man to die but once, upon which you have an appointment that you will keep. And therein a decision shall be rendered. Consequences will be made known in front of everybody, all of heaven and even the earth itself. Now, the alternative to that, well, not the alternative, is but to find your name in this book and be led forth in Christ. Jesus says, I will come and take you there myself. Jesus will show up. I don't know how I'm drawing Jesus. This is Jesus. That's a robe. Saying, come on, bro, you did a good job. We're going somewhere really cool. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and take you back myself. If it were not so, I would not have told you. This seals the Father's promise. All the way. What Father's promise? Before the beginning of time, the Father's promise was that those who believe in my Son, my sacrifice, my man of sorrows, shall be led forth in perfect peace, unafraid of anything. Such that, and this is the beautiful verse I love, the hill, mountains and hills themselves shall break forth in shouts of joy. How is that possible? Because they're right there in the courtroom testifying that you were on God's side or you weren't on God's side. You shall be led forth in perfect peace. That's led forth by Jesus. He says, I'll lead you forth in my peace. Such that the hills and the mountains themselves shall be breaking forth in shouts of joy, congratulating you. The leaves of the tree shall clap their hands, welcoming you. Could you see that? All these trees. Go, go get her. probably keep me out of heaven. But, and then you will have an everlasting memorial and reign with your father forever. What is all that? Just good record? Oh, it's a promise. Uttered a million years ago. Let's go back to this chapter. This didn't sound very promising. No, it didn't. You know why? Because Tyre sided with the wrong guys. They backed the wrong horse. So what happens? Well, as we know, a bad bunch of barbarians called the Babylonians came to town. And they just so destroyed Tyre, that beautiful seaport city, that it was never rebuilt again. And the Phoenicians were no more after that time. Now, years later, 19... 60-something, a bunch of Arabs got thrown out of the Jordanian area over here, and they came back to this somewhat worthless, barren piece of property, and they became the Palestinians. I don't know how to spell Palestinian, but anyway, that's who they became, and they rebuilt another little city here, which is nothing, and they have caused trouble for Israel ever since. That's how it came to be to this day. If you wonder, where did the fellows come from? 
that's where they came from. But that didn't happen until the early 60s. So, see what's happening here? What we're talking about in Ezekiel is 550 BC, way over here in the Persian Gulf when they're still in captivity. And God is trying to explain to Israel, uh, Ezekiel what the heck happened. How Jerusalem got destroyed, wiped off the map, how Israel got destroyed, and how they ended up way over here in a strange land, strange language, strange custom as servants and prisoners. How did that happen to God's chosen people? Well, because they too stepped out of the promise. And God said, because you have, this generation I will destroy. I told you, you knew it, you didn't do it important in your life? Well, let me introduce you to him. These guys backed the wrong horse. These guys backed the wrong horse. By the way, as we get down this further in chapter, they're toast too. And God said, well, you know, don't think they're getting away with anything. You, I'm going to leave a remnant. So all the children, eight or nine years old, they were taken away as slaves. They were brought back over to the Persian Gulf here, which is modern day Iran. <clears throat> And in those days it was Babylon. Uh, and they were raised. 50 years go by, so now those little children are grown men and they're all gathered together out in the wilderness. God chose one of them. Ezekiel said, come with me. I'm going to teach you everything that these guys did. They screwed up ended you guys up over there. And after I teach you, I'm going to go back to this stubborn, obstinate generation of people who care less about God and tell them, look, the only bet you got is to go to God right now. And as simple or as profound as that may be, the fact of the matter is, you've got to remember, this is the third time God destroys his own people. Not the first. The first was way back here. The second was back here. This is the third time. And yet there would be one more to come. Because 500 years later, a man named Jesus would show up and the temple was rebuilt and it was huge and it was glorious and glorious. The strength of those buildings. Even Peter, you know, the old Peter always sticks his foot in his mouth. And Jesus looks at him and says, Oh, Peter, don't trust in the stones of the magnificence of these huge buildings. Because truly I tell you, the day is already here where not one stone of this temple shall be ever over. 33 years later, the Jews were slaughtered, Rome destroyed everything, burnt down that temple to the ground. And that was 55 AD, it is now 2020 AD. Do we got a temple yet? Mm -mm. Got nothing. Because God said, what? This temple will not be rebuilt until my son returns through the beautiful gate and restores the temple. Well, that's kind of like the last judgment, guys. <laughs> so I'm not really looking forward to any new temples in the neighborhood. Oh, of course, that's all part of God's word, if you believe that sort of stuff. There's all kinds of chants and crystals and other stuff. Astrology, you can believe in that crap. So that's what this chapter is all about. Don't say, well, he's getting away with murder. Well, how come the evil guys always become rich? The poor little lady that punched over the pew and crying her eyes out because she just loves Jesus. She is rich. This guy, landfill. Expensive landfill, but landfill. And that's what Jesus tried to say. Remember the Pharisees, the great priests with all the diplomas on the walls and their robes and all their stuff saying, hey, look at me, God, you're lucky to have me. And they were you know, just pulling the rods and the bars out of there, throwing them in the coffers. And the quiet old thing slips in throws her two little denarii in there. Got two pennies. You know what Jesus said about her? She is a blessed woman. The richest, truly the richest woman in all of the kingdom. And 
Judas was the one that spoke up. You know, Judas the bad guy. He said, oh, shit, that's the only two penny. What the heck is that going to do? Well, because these guys gave to make it a show. And they gave out of their abundance. But this woman threw in all she had. That might have bought her a half a, loaf, half a crust of bread that day. That woman loves God. These people love themselves and the world. These guys are back in the wrong dang horse. Ah, but they're rich and they're getting away with it. They're not getting away with anything. If I really remind you of one thing, ladies and gentlemen, that I want you to take with you in your mind every day of your life is this right here. Each one of us, according to God's word, will stand before his glory, the fullness of his glory. I don't know what that means, but I'm melting. Each one of us will stand before the fullness of his glory naked. I don't think that means no clothes. According to the word itself, it means fully known. Everything you've done, did, thought about doing, or didn't do. And the mountains and the hills and the earth itself and all the witnesses in heaven will testify against you. 20, 27 times. The Bible tells us that. That's a whole lot of testimony against us. Okay? That's chapter 24, huh? Don't hear a lot of sermons out of this one, do you? <laughs> Thanks for coming. We'll pick it up next week. Or 26, I guess. Chapter 26. We'll pick it up next week with chapter 27. My old track number ought to be a good one. Okay. Let's go to church and get holy. So you